Survival is all about staying alive under emergency conditions anywhere in the world. Survival is not just for the camper, climber, or pilot. It's for everyone, young and old, because anyone can be confronted by a survival situation. The more knowledge you have, the greater your confidence and ability to handle any situation. This program will provide you with that knowledge and the skills that will build that confidence. Lofty Wiseman served with the British Army's Elite Special Air Services, the SAS, for 26 years. After spending years learning survival techniques firsthand in the Arctic, desert, and jungle, in such places as Malaya, Borneo, Aden, Belize, and Kenya, Lofty became the chief survival instructor in the SAS. Since leaving the SAS, Lofty established the School of Survival in England, which has students from all walks of life from all around the world. In 1986, Lofty's book, The SAS Survival Handbook, was published, and it became the number two bestseller in England. It's currently in print in seven languages. In addition to these activities, Lofty serves as a consultant to law enforcement agencies, corporations, security firms, and elite military units worldwide. Lofty, are you ready to tell us what we need to know to survive in a harsh world? Yes, Steve, I sure am. Okay. So how did you get so involved in survival training, Lofty? Yeah, survival is a basic military skill, and uh, we didn't, never knew where we were going to find ourselves in the world, and we was always on the long line of resupply, and so we had to have the ability to live off the land. People who have survived in very difficult situations, and they aren't the kind of people you would expect to survive. What makes a survivor? Um, Steve, they've all got one thing in common, and this is mental determination. Um, survival is all about, okay, mental toughness. It's probably 80% of mental exercise and only 20% of physical exercise. Fitness must be important, though. Sure, the fitter you are, the better you can apply yourself. But remember, um, survival is for everyone, the young and the old, and it's no good, say, climbing a tree for 1,000 calories of fruit and you've expended 2,000 calories to obtain them. So we must think things through, um, assess the situation, um, make sure everyone is safe, give them all a job to do, and get the best from them. Okay, in order to do that, you've got a program. You've got a series of things you've got to think about. What do we have to think about to do that right? Okay, um, what we must learn about is food, fire, shelter, water, navigation, and medical. They're, they're the main elements of survival. Well, that's an awfully lot to think about. Uh, how do I know what the priorities are? What should I think about first? Okay, what we do, Steve, we put all these elements into an acronym called PLAN. Now, P stands for protection, L for location, A, acquisition, and N for navigation. All right, tell me a little more. What do you mean by protection? Okay, um, however we find ourselves in a survival situation, okay, be it an aircraft crashing and there's a likelihood of exploding fuel, we must have protection from further danger. So we evacuate the immediate area. Likewise, there might be an impending avalanche or a forest fire. We mustn't stay in its path. So protection from further danger and then protection from the elements. We make a shelter to give us protection from the rain, the wind, or in the tropics, the sun. Next, location. We must put our signals out. We want to be found. And so we draw attention to ourselves by making signal fires, air panels, etc. Now, while we're going to be rescued, we're going to be hungry and thirsty. So A stands for acquisition of food and for water. Then finally, navigation. Uh, once we've used all the local resources in the area, we've got to think about moving out to safety if the rescue don't come maybe within three weeks because we've used all the firewood, uh, all the animals have been eaten, all the plants have been gone, and so what we must do is think about moving because we're open to disease now. Um, however good we practice personal and camp hygiene, okay, we're going to soil the area, so now we think about moving. So navigation is the last thing we do. Three to four weeks, that's a long time. Uh, how long do you need to be prepared to survive? Yep, there's no time limit on survival. We must survive all our life. It's a full-time job, and so life, we survive until we die. All right, I've got the right mental attitude. I know what's important. I've got a plan for putting that into effect. Is there anything I can take along with me to give me a little edge? Okay, Steve, we always say carry a survival tin. Now, this should be carried in a pocket at all times. Not when you go to the wild, but even in the town whether you go ballroom dancing or walking a dog. A small tin like this gives you the ability to make or acquire food, fire, shelter, water, navigation and medical. You'll see a lot of these items being used throughout the program. 
But basically, it's got a flint for lighting a fire, a small piece of candle, again for fire lighting, needle and thread for running repairs on clothing, a scalpel blade, which you can skin, prepare game with, a flexible saw, some chemicals, um, medications, plasters for general abrasions, and it's a real bonus in a survival situation if you've got your tin with you. That's an awfully lot to find in a very small tin. Let's say I'm making a trip where the possibility of finding myself in a real emergency situation, a survival situation, is, is a little higher than the average trip. What else might I take along? Okay, Steve, um, everyone should also carry, when they go to the wild, a survival pouch. Now, there's much more equipment on here. This is on the belt, carried at all times. It's got a flashlight, which we can use for signaling, and also we'll show you how to light a fire with this. And there's a container, which we can boil our water, cook our food in, with a stove, okay, for cooking, flares, so we can be found, uh, air marker panels, and a variety of stuff. Again, a lot of this you'll be seen used on the program. Okay, out of all of this equipment, what's the single most important piece of survival gear? Steve, you must have a knife, okay? This is a small folding lock knife, and so it's got a positive lock on it. And again, we use this for making a shelter, preparing game, and lighting a fire. It's an essential part of our equipment, and we must look after it. That knife looks pretty small. Uh, what could I take along that it'd be just, just a little bit more effective? Okay, Steve, this is a parang, and it's an excellent tool, not only for the jungle, but for anywhere in the world. Effectively, it's three tools in one. From here to here, it's very sharp, and we use this for skinning, preparing vegetables for cooking. From here to here, it's like the axe, and all the heavy work is done by cutting trees. And from here to here, again, it's very sharp, and we can use it for preparing skins for clothing, etc. Now, in the jungle, it gets very really, um, slick and sweaty, so we use the throng, so it won't come out of the hand when we're using it. Now, in the jungle, if anyone gets injured, we've got to prepare a landing site for a helicopter. And many times in the regiment, we use these all the time for cutting large trees, mahoganies and teak, up to four foot in diameter. And it's got to be done fast so the helicopter can come in and save the guy's life. So we thoroughly recommend this. Also, in the jungle, it's possible to make a raft and float down a large river to safety. So anywhere in the world, the parring, okay, the serious adventure should carry one. Okay, Lofty, you've shown us a lot. Now, let's go out in the field and begin our survival training. Remember the acronym PLAN. P for protection. That's protection from further danger, then protection from the elements. L stands for location. We want to be found. A is acquisition on food and water. While we're waiting to be rescued, we're going to get hungry, and more important, we're going to be thirsty. N stands for navigation. If no one rescues us, finally, we might have to walk to safety. Now, protection is our first concern. It's no good Trying to build a shelter on a hilltop, we're going to be cold and exposed to the weather. So what we must have a prime concern is water. We're going to find water down in the valley. Also, we need material to build a shelter from and hopefully find some food. This looks an ideal spot for shelter because one, there's plenty of material to build a shelter. It's near water, but not directly on it, so there's no risk of flooding. There's plenty of fuel for a fire. There's no deadfalls to come crashing down. There's no bees, wasps, or hornets in the trees, and there's a nice open area to the front where we can lay out our emergency signals. Let's build a lean-type shelter. Okay, for a start, what I've done, I've put a cross bar between two trees and about four foot high. And then, at 45 degree angle, I've put the back stakes in. I've dug them in the ground and lent them forward. I've now got to put poles all the way along here, 45 degree angles, about 18 inches apart. Now I've got the vertical ones in, I've got to put the horizontal sticks in. Now the spacing depends on what I'm going to use for thatch.
Make sure it's strong. Remember, move the horizontals in and out the verticals to lock them in place. It must be strong because this is going to protect you. Now, what seems like a shortcut, ultimately, it takes more time in the long run. If this falls down or lets in the rain, we've got to rebuild it. So let's do it right first time. There are many materials we can use to thatch the shelter. Grasses, rushes, even mud. In this case, we're going to use pine boughs. OK, we start from the bottom and we start building it all the way across and then overlapping until we've covered the frame. We must ensure we put lots of this on to keep out the rain. That's the back finished. Now we've ensured there's no holes in it and it's thick enough to repel any rain. The 45 degree angle is also very important. Now we can improve this further by filling in the sides. What we do is exactly the same as the back. We angle in verticals and we intertwine the horizontals and then we thatch it. Now this gives us more room. We can stow our firewood there. We can put equipment there and it also stops the wind from whistling around the sides. We can further improve on this by putting on the front porch. This is easily done. Just angle in two sticks, put on the crossbar. And what we're going to do now is bring the thatch over, and this gives us more leg room. And also, when we build a fire here, we're going to get convection currents going right the way to the back of the shelter. Now, we've got paracord and we've got wire in the survival tin. But what we can do, or what we can use, is natural materials. This is just a vine, and if we take it easy enough, and this is green, we can get a lash in. So I'm just going to lash this on here. Now, using a vine, it's important to keep it nice and tight and to overlap it several times, and it would be quite sturdy. Now, to finish up, we just push it through between the two, Take it round, and this will lock it securely in position. Now I've got a good strong shelter, I don't care what the weather does. I'm going to be dry, and once I get a fire going, I'm going to be warm. Now the idea of this front porch is my fire's to the front, and I'm going to get convection currents going right away to the back of the shelter, and keep me warm. This shelter is good for the rain, the wind, and the snow. However, when I go to the tropics, I need to construct a different type of shelter. Let's go and have a look what I've got over here. This is a pole bed, built on an A-frame. It's very strong, and the more weight you put on it, the stronger it becomes. Now, this is ideal when you've got bad ground conditions, such as you find in the jungle with creepy crawlies and ants and termites. It gets you off the ground. Also, in hot climates, you need the cooling effect of the air going underneath the bed keeping you cool. Now in the jungle it rains very hard and it comes unexpectedly so we need a shelter fast. This will keep me dry and so will a parachute teepee. Let's go and see how we make one. This is a parachute teepee. It's easily put up and remember a parachute is part of our life preserving equipment. Now as long as it's steep enough it will repel the rain, it will keep off the wind and in the sun it offers good shade. Why don't you come inside and have a look? As you can see, it's larger than it looks from the outside. Now remember, keep off the walls when it's raining and you won't get wet. Really interesting shelters, Lofty. If you were in a colder climate, the Arctic for instance, what would you use there? Okay, in the Arctic we would use the snow. We can either dig down and make a snow hole or build up and make an igloo. No matter where we find ourselves in the world, we can always make a shelter. In the desert, we must have shade. So again, we can dig down, put some material up, get shade from the sun. On the plains, we can dig down or use sod and build a shelter. So no matter where you find yourself in the world, there's always natural materials we can use. Let me ask you about the pole bed. I didn't quite see how you constructed that. Could you demonstrate that for us here? OK, the pole bed, this is a model of it. We start by digging in, OK, our A-frame, dig them um, securely into the ground, and it's best if we can either lean them against a tree or build like a triangular and dig this one in and this will prevent that from toppling. We then take our material and in the sleeves provided we insert our poles and then this goes on the top 
And the more weight we put down on this, okay, um, the firmer it becomes. We now put our shoulder over the top, making a basher, and this protects us from the elements. You know, I noticed in that last shot when you were inside the TP, there, there wasn't a center pole. I would have expected a center pole. How do you handle that? With the parachute, what we do is at the apex, we got a cord and we tie a rock to this and we throw it over a convenient branch and we hoist it up and as the parachute hangs down, we then peg it to the ground, making sure we got a nice steep angle and we peg it nice and wide and you can see how big it was. It gives us adequate protection. <laughs> really interesting. Okay, we've covered shelters. Now let's go back out in the field for another aspect of protection. Now we've built our shelter, we can consider lighting a fire. Now fire can mean the difference between life and death in a survival situation. We must be able to light a fire under any condition, anywhere in the world. Now there are three important points to remember. First, you stand in dead wood. Two, with a sharp knife, we feather our wood. And three, keep your matches dry. Now I'll show you what I mean over here. This is the shaven wood. Remember, we take standing dead wood and we shave it with our sharp knife. What we do, we keep on turning the wood around and cutting slivers, and so one match will ignite this. Now, any pieces drop in, they go in the fireplace and can be used. This is what we're gonna use for our tinder. Now, here's a selection of tinder. This one here is birch bark, and it burns just like paper. This is burlap, and as long as it's natural material, i.e. it's not nylon or plastic, this is sisal, hemp, or jute, cotton bull, different uh, dried grasses and sedges, and shaven wood. Pine resin is an excellent way of lighting a fire. Just collect it and use it like a candle. Also, if you lose a filling, the resin can be used to plug the gap, and when it reaches the moisture of the mouth, it solidifies and acts as a temporary filling. Remember, good tinder takes the mirrors of sparks to ignite. We've got our tinder arranged now, and we need one match to ignite it. Let's have a look at some different types of matches. Don't carry matches like this, as it's only a matter of time before they get wet, either through sweat or from the rain. This is a waterproof container, and it contains waterproof matches. However, these matches must be struck on a special surface, and this is on the outside of the container. So although the matches are dry, if this gets wet, it renders the matches useless. This is the ideal container. Again, it's waterproof, but now it contains Strike Anywhere matches. It has also got a flint on the base of it, and we'll show you how this is used in a minute. Okay, now we put it on our kindling and arranging it like a wigwam. And it's as easy as that to light a fire. Don't disturb the fire, it doesn't like being disturbed. Just add to it. Once you've got a good hot fire going, then we start feeding on the main fuel. Now don't bother to cut these, just end feed them on and arrange them like a star. This way they would catch. The fire's burning merrily, we can do all our cooking, we can boil our water. As the fire dies down and we don't need to cook, we just separate these slightly and this way we're going to conserve our fuel. Now you can see how easy it is to light a fire as long as you follow those three basic rules. One, collect standing dead wood. Two, shave it. Third, Keep your matches dry and in a proper container. Now, it's all very well when you've got matches, but if you've got no matches, there's other methods we can use. The first one we're going to show is the magnifying glass. Use the glass to intensify the sun's rays. Get as small as dot as possible and direct it onto your tinder. In this case, we've got some cotton bud and also burnt wood is ideal. Another method of lighting a fire is using the flint from the survival tin. Arrange cotton, shave your wood as before, and use your knife, scrape the flint, ignite the cotton, and then put this on top. 
and away she goes. This is a magnesium block with a flint to the back. In difficult conditions, we can shave magnesium off the block, collect them on our tinder, and then use the flint to ignite the magnesium. Now you see how readily that burns. Remember, aircraft are made out of the same material. Another way of lighting fires is using chemicals. Take the potassium permanganate from the survival tin and pour a small pinch of it here. Add a pinch of sugar, mix it together, and we can ignite this using friction, spark, or glycerine. It's unlikely that you've got potassium chloride with you like this. However, it is found in some throat tablets. As before, we add a pinch of sugar. Now sugar is the oxidizing agent. We mix it together. And now we can ignite this either by spark, friction, or sulfuric acid. We find sulfuric acid in a battery in a vehicle. In this case, we're going to use a spark. Now the last chemical we're going to look at is sodium chlorate. Now this is a common weed killer. I'll prepare some here as before, just a pinch of sugar, and we're going to ignite it by spark. As you can see, this burns very fiercely and must be used with extreme caution. It must only be used as an expedient survival technique. Now the next method I'm going to use is equally as dangerous. We're going to use ammunition and pyrotechnics. Now hunters and military personnel will probably have these with them. I'm going to carefully cut through the case and expose the propellant inside. Now we must do this carefully. I've now got to cut through the wadding. And now I've exposed the powder. We tip some of it out, and this is what I'm going to ignite. Now that burns very fast, so you must be prepared and have your fire prepared. Now we're going to go into pyrotechnics. Now flares contain magnesium, and we'll be foolish to start cutting these in half. So we're going to use another technique. Let's have a look over here. This is a typical distress flare. And when activated, it fires a solid block of magnesium at great speed. So to light a fire from it, I muster it very carefully. Here I prepare the fireplace with lots of energy absorbing material. And then I'm going to fire the flare into this and it's going to ignite all the dry brush that I prepared there. As you can see, it's very effective. Most aircraft carry this type of flare gun. We can light a fire with it exactly as we did before, but remember, there's more energy in this cartridge, so we must be very, very careful. Now, we've shown different ways of lighting fires, and when all else fails, we're going to go back to nature. We're going to use the bow drill method, two pieces of wood. Let's see how it's done. These are the components for the bow drill. We have the bow, cotton bandage, the baseboard, spindle, and top board. What I've got to do first is to prepare the baseboard for the spindle. I take my knife and I make it flat. I make a slight indentation so the spindle can rotate in it. Now the principle behind this is the base wood is soft and the spindle is hard. So once we located it in its socket and rotated it with the drill, the hard wood, it grinds away to the soft wood and it's important to cut this keyway in to collect the very fine tinder that is generated. The more pressure we put on the bow, this starts glowing just like a cigarette end. We transfer it to our tinder and then by blowing, we get a flame. Now, as you can see, that took a lot of time and you must practice it. 
Let me give you a few more tips on lighting the fire. Remember, in the survival kit, we carry a candle. Now, when you light a match, always light your candle first, whether you're going to light a cigarette, your stove, or start a fire. And what we do, we use this under the fire. As soon as it starts going, we recover the candle, put it out, and we only use a small piece of it. Now, we can take pine resin and make a candle. It burns exactly the same and is an excellent way of lighting the fire. Now, a piece this size will burn for about 20 minutes. Knowing how to light a fire is not enough. We must practice it. We must be confident before we find ourselves in a survival situation that we can light a fire. Remember, now we've got a shelter, we've got a fire, we are protected. The next thing we've got to worry about is being found. Lofty, you made starting a fire with a flint and steel look so easy. How did you do that? Steve, it really is easy, even when wet. Okay, using a striker, and a downward movement like so, have a go. I'm sure you do it. I think I can do this, huh? Get some cotton wool. Okay. Let's get the right side there. Let's do it. We'll try it again here. Yep. There you go. And there we go. And we got fire. It's as easy as that. Okay. Okay. Now, you said also not to cut into the magnesium flare. What was that about? Okay, this type of aerial flare, there's a rocket motor here, and there's a magnesium block here. Now, cutting into it could cause friction, and it could go off, causing serious injury and burns. Also, if you fire this on anything that's solid, it will bounce back, again, causing injury. So when we lit the fire from it, we dug a hole, we lined it with energy-absorbing material, like dry leaves and grasses, put all our tinder at the back, prepared our fireplace, and when we fire this into it, we look away, the ball of magnesium goes out, ignites our tinder, it starts the fire. If it hits anything solid, it will bounce back and can cause serious injury. So never cut into your flare, and prepare your fireplace carefully if you're gonna use this to light a fire. Okay, you also mentioned starting a fire with a flashlight. Right, okay, this is the flashlight we used. If you go back to the field, we'll show you how we done it. Okay. You can use your flashlight to start a fire. Now a useful tip is at the base of the flashlight, carry 4-0 steel wool and spare bulbs. Also keep the last battery around the wrong way. This way the torch won't go off accidentally in your pack. Turn it round to use it. And the way I'm gonna light a fire using the torch is I remove the reflector and across the two terminals, I'm gonna short circuit the battery using the steel wool. Prepare the fire, bridge the terminal with a wire wool, and add some of your chemicals to the side. Then turn on the torch. And that's how easy it is to light the fire. Well, that seemed to work really well, but it didn't do the flashlight any good. Oh, no, it sure didn't, Steve, but remember, in a cold climate, we must have a fire. So if you've got no other means of lighting a fire, it's okay to sacrifice your flashlight. So remember, we must have fire. It's the difference between life and death in a cold situation. All right. Okay, we've covered protection. We've looked around our local area. We've gotten out of immediate danger. We've constructed a shelter, and we've got fire. And now we're ready for the next element in our plan. In the first part of our outdoor survival program, Lofty Wiseman told us about a plan for survival. And we learned that protection is the first priority. Safety from immediate danger, constructing a shelter, and starting a fire. Now we're ready for the next step of our survival plan, location. Lofty, what do you mean by location? Okay, Steve, what we must do is put out grand air signals in the hope of being found. Now, regardless of what sort of journey we undergo, we always alert the authorities, be it the forest rangers or the coast guards, and we tell them where we're going, what time we're expected at the other end. So when we've gone missing, people are aware that we are um, maybe in danger and they know where to search for us. However, in a survival situation, it arises because of freak weather, instrument failure, and we find ourselves somewhere on the ground and we ain't got a clue where we are. So we must have the ability to draw attention to ourselves. 
Okay, draw attention to ourselves. What the visual signals can we make? Okay, the, the best one is the fire triangle. If you look here, this is what it looks like. Once we've got protection, we now go on to location. This entails putting out ground-to-air panels so we can be found. Here we've got the fire triangle. It's a tripod dug into the ground with a platform built on it. On the platform, we prepare our fire exactly as we did before. We feather our wood, but now we use pine resin, any inflammable material from the aircraft or the wreckage, like petrol, oil, lubricants, rubber tires, upholstery. So just one match will ignite it. We cover the whole thing in fir branches. Now this keeps it dry, it's off the ground, so don't matter if it snows or floods, the fire is always dry. When we ignite this, we leave the green stuff on by day, this generates the smoke. Of a night, we take it off and we just have a bright flame. We've got spare wood underneath, and so all we're waiting for now is the aircraft to come and we ignite it. As you see, we've got three fires in a triangle. This is the international distress signal. All we've got to do now is cover this up and wait for aircraft. It seems to me there's a good chance that the aircraft will be long gone before you get your fires lit. Yeah, that's exactly right, Steve. However, the aircraft flies a particular pattern called a baseline search. What it does, it overlaps itself, covering the ground, flying up and down. So hopefully when the aircraft, okay, passes you, you hear it's approaching, you light your fires, and it's probably missed them. However, eventually it will turn around, fly downwind again, and when it passes you this time, it should pick up your signals. So it's passed your signals, it's made a downward leg on the way back, it sees your signals, it starts circling the area, indicating that it's seen you. So by day, it will circle your position, waggle its wings, and by night, it will flash its lights. And this will indicate that you've been discovered. Are there any other signals we should be thinking about? Yes, we've got to put out our grand air signals. This way we can communicate with the aircraft. Now, using the aluminum foil from the survival pouch, we can make different figures which are internationally understood. Now this is nice and bright and it stands out well. Now we can improvise this if we've got nothing else by using clothing. Most anoraks and sleeping bags, they're brightly colored, blues and oranges are great. We can also dig trenches down or turn stones over or even trample snow to make these figures which will stand out from the air. What figures do we have to know? Okay, it's real easy. If you remember this, F, I require food and water. Most important is one bar, I need immediate assistance. And an aircraft will take a lot of risk to come down and see what's wrong. Okay, two L's means all is well. So now we see Phil, it's real easy to remember. Now the aircraft will drop a message. Now initially the aircraft will be a fixed wing aircraft because it's got the range and duration. So it can't come down and land. So it would drop a message and it will say something like, do you need assistance? So you say yes, affirmative. It drop another message, do you know where you are? Negative. So if you remember this, F I double L, Y and N, affirmative, negative, that's all we need to know. Okay, that seems real simple. Now, are these panels going to attract an aircraft's attention or is there a better way to do this? Um, most rescues have been affected by the use of a heliograph. And this is just a shiny reflective material. It can be improvised, hubcap, piece of glass from the wreckage, or the shiny underside of your survival tin. In this case, we've got a heliograph or a signal mirror, and we just pick up the sun's rays on our hand, direct them up to the aircraft, and looking through the sighting hole, we use it as a signal mirror. Okay. Under ideal conditions, it's good for 15 miles. I recall that we used a flare to start a fire, but their primary purpose is signaling. What kinds would you carry? Okay, um, we carry smoke, flares, and also para-illuminating flares. And what we got, we always use a contrasting color. In this case, we're using yellow smoke. And as you see, it stands out real well against the trees. So don't use green if you're in thick vegetation. Always a contrast. So any color smoke is good as long as it stands out. All right, the smoke signal is good for the daytime. What do we do at night? OK, Steve, we use our flare. And we must be careful. We must make sure there's no obstruction above where we're going to fire it, like we're underneath the tree. So we must be in the open. And also, when we fire it, keep it at arm's length and look away. Sometimes you do get particles coming back. Now, this particular flare goes up to 600 feet. It's very bright and it can be seen from a, a long distance away. And if we've got the, the, the space and, and the room, we take an even bigger flare. Sure. 
Here you see a power illuminating flare, and what it does, exactly the same, you must make sure there's no overhead obstruction. You fire it to the air, and it probably goes up to a thousand feet, and now it's suspended under a parachute. So it stays in the air for a long time, and so you've got more chance of being seen. Lofty, what about the EPIRBs, emergency radio beacons? These are small battery-operated transmitters that can be received by aircraft and, and now even by satellites. They're very lightweight, half a pound or so. Uh, are these a good idea? Yeah, they sure are. If you've got the room to take them, you never got enough kit in the emergency situation. Yeah, they're excellent. All right. Now we've completed the second part of our plan for survival, location. We've constructed a fire triangle, learned how to communicate with aircraft with signal panels, heliograph, and flares. Next in our outdoor survival program, we'll talk about acquisition, getting what we need so we can survive until rescue comes. Water sustains life. If you follow any water course in the world, eventually it would lead you to safety. Now, 90% of all sickness in a survival situation is caused by drinking bad water. So what we must do is sterilize it. There are two ways of sterilizing water. One is by boiling, the second one is by chemicals. You can take your sterilizing tablets from the survival kit and we can use these to sterilize water. However, it's always best first to filter your water. I've got a filter here, let's fill it up before we sterilize. Now this is a canvas bag of porous material and it allows water to drip to the bottom and I'm going to collect it and this is where I'm going to put my chlorine tablet. It's important, especially if I get my water from muddy puddles and it's heavily sedimented because the chlorine in these tablets attack the major particles leaving the water still suspect. Now we can carry one of these but in a survival situation we can improvise one. Let's have a look what I've got over here. This is an improvised filter made from a sock. What we got is a layer of charcoal, sand and moss and grass. What we do now is pour the water through this and collect at the other end. As the water is filtering through, we collect it at the bottom. Here's a selection of water containers. This one was specially developed for special forces and is ideal for the base camp. To get water, we just press against the side. Here we have water. This one is a bladder which can be filled up and carried. Using the condom from the survival tin, we can carefully put two pints of water into it. We must wrap this up in cloth and use this just as a membrane. The best way of sterilizing water is by boiling. If we're lucky enough to have a can, use the wire from the survival tin to make a handle. Never leave the tin balancing on burning embers or on rocks, as it will topple and you'll lose your water and probably put the fire out. Now boil the water for seven minutes at sea level. For every thousand feet of elevation, add another minute. Potassium permanganate is a good way of sterilizing water. The small container like this from the survival tin is good for sterilizing 300 gallons of water. Now it's important that we get the color just right. If I don't put sufficient in, the water will still be suspect. If I put too much in, the water becomes caustic. So in a small amount of water like this, just one or two crystals is sufficient and we go by colour. We want this to be a light pink. That's just about the right colour. This is a dried up water course and if we dig down long enough, deep enough, eventually we come to water. We can still collect that water however but we now can let the trees pump it up for us. Take a plastic bag and place it on the leaf of any green tree and the tree acts as a pump. It takes the water from the ground and we get evaporation in the plastic bag and all we've got to do is collect it without all the manual labour of digging for it.
This is a solar still that we use in semi-arid and desert conditions. It's a metre square of plastic sheet. You dig a hole a metre square, one metre deep, and you arrange the plastic sheet and weight it so it forms a V. Now what happens, this causes condensation. Water, it forms underneath the V and it runs down to the bottom and you need a container underneath to collect the moisture. We can make this more efficient by putting any green vegetation in it or urinating in it. To save disturbing the still, we can also use a siphon. Now with a siphon, you can take the water exactly when you need it. There's no need to purify the water, it's absolutely pure. Now as you can see in the still, it's also a good insect trap. Let's have a look underneath the still and see how much water we have collected. Under ideal conditions, this is good for a quart of water. We've got probably a pint here, it's been in six hours, so we're doing okay. Now, don't make these any bigger, the metre square is the optimum. If you need more water, carry more sheets of polythene and dig more solar stills. Ensure that the siphon is right to the bottom of your collector. Now, as you can see, the water is nice and pure and does not need sterilising. Remember, if you're going to urinate in here, make sure you do it before you put in the collecting pot. Another method of collecting water is a dew trap. Let's take a look at one. This is a dew trap. What we've got now is clear plastic sheet in a hole a foot square and a foot deep. In the hole we place clean, smooth rocks. Now this still has been working all night for us. The way it works is the plastic cools off more rapidly than the hot stone. And this creates condensation. Now you must ensure you take the water out before the sun comes up. Otherwise it works in reverse and it starts evaporating the water that you've collected. Still using the sun, I'd like to show you now a solar still inverted. Here we've got a source of suspect water. What we're going to do is take clear plastic sheet in, put it over the top of it, seal it around the bottom and the sun's going to do the rest. With all these solar stills, we must use clear plastic sheeting, not the dark variety. In this case, I've put a pebble in the centre of my plastic sheet, I've tied it around to form an anchor point, and I've suspended it from a convenient branch. I've then formed a tent over the suspect water, and then I've carefully rolled the polythene inside, and this is going to trap the water as it evaporates inside my tent. I've sealed it all the way around the edge, and we leave this now and the warmer the sun is, the better this works. Okay, Lofty, I understand how the solar still works, but tell me again how you get the water out. Okay, we carefully wrap the polythene underneath, and when we want the water, what we do, we start lifting it out from the side carefully and tilting it to the lowest part of the still, and in time, we turn the still right upside down, and the water's all collected in the polythene curl at the lowest point. After the water is filtered, like you did in the sock, is the water safe to drink at that point? No, Steve, we must always treat the water. Regardless of water source or how clear and sparkling the water looks, the filter only takes out the suspended matter. He don't take out a bacteria. So we must always treat what we got in our container, either by boiling or by chemicals. Okay, boiling water is okay if you have a metal container, but what if you don't have one? Okay, Steve. Imagine this is a sheet of birch bark. We can fold this carefully. Okay, fold in the sides, fold at the ends, and make the creases to the rear, fold it over, do the same this end. What we made now is a coolerman. Now, if we put this, okay, on ashes filled with water, what we got, we got moisture inside, indirect heat, and the water will boil in this without rupturing the vessel. <laughs> Very clever. Lofty, why don't you sum up the important things we need to remember about water? Okay, Steve, every living thing on Earth is dependent on water. So what we say is we go three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food with no ill effects. So regardless of water source, we must always treat it. 
Now, if we've not got any water, we just don't eat because it takes all our body fluids to assimilate the food. And fats and proteins are the worst. And also, appetite will suffer. So if we've got no water, we don't eat. However, if we've got water, a plentiful supply of good water, we can eat just about anything. And in tight situations, it's been recorded that people have eaten their leather boots and they've got protein from it. But you must have lots of water to digest it and for the body to assimilate the food. Okay, let's hope we don't have to eat our boots. You've mentioned food. Now, what kinds of food are we going to find in the wild? Okay, Steve, in the wild there's a variety of foods and it starts with the nutritional ladder. Right at the bottom, we've got plants. Now, it's just a matter of recognition and picking. They're not going to run away. And then we build up fungi, slightly more nutritional value than plants. Insects, probably the first living thing an injured person can get are insects. Above insects come fish, if you're lucky enough to be, to be by water, we've got the fish in the water, and then finally, game. Pound for pound, we can't beat meat. Of all the plants available, some are edible, some may even be poisonous. How can we tell the difference? Okay, with plants, and it's only plants, we've got an edibility test. This is the edibility test. We pick a fresh specimen, and first we use the senses. Feel it. It might be prickly or hairy, and this will indicate what it is. Next, we crush it and we smell it. There may be a familiar smell like mint or garlic. This will also indicate what it is. We then take a small portion and we place it underneath the tongue, and this is where the flavor buds are. Now, if there's any discomfort, like a burning or stinging sensation, discard it, you've got a poisonous plant. There are two poisons in the plant kingdom, and they're both accompanied by the same sign i.e. a burning, stinging sensation. Now, one is water-soluble, one is not. So with nettles, when we boil them, we destroy the toxin and they're safe to eat. If we do the same with rhubarb leaves, we concentrate the poison. Now, if there's no discomfort, we chew the same piece and we put all the juice around the mouth and we spit it out. We wait a further five minutes and again, any discomfort, discard the test. Finally, we swallow the same specimen and now we wait five hours. If there's no ill effect, we can say that plant is safe to eat. However, it's a long drawn out process and it's so much easier to identify some of the common plants. So let's go and have a look and see what we can find. The bulrush is an excellent source of nourishment. Now in late summer, it's got the familiar seed spike on the top and we can eat all parts of this. What we're looking for here is the root stock. Now the root of any plant is a storehouse and it contains good starch, so it's an excellent source of nourishment. The dandelion is very common and easily recognized by its flower. When it's not in bloom, its distinctive leaf also helps to identify it. Now all parts of the plant are edible and we cook the leaf just like spinach. Now the plant also has a tap root and if we expose this, it's best by roasting the root and it also makes a palatable coffee. We can also cook this like parsnip. The plantain is very common and we can use it as spinach, but it does taste bitter. In late summer, it's got a seed spike here, which is full of seeds. Now these seeds contain oil. If we put these in the soup, we're gonna get good nutritional value. We can also use all the plant medicinally, where if we put it on a wound, it does help stop bleeding. Mint is an excellent flavouring when we add it to our stew. It's easily identified by its distinctive smell. We can also use it medicinally if we mix it with charcoal and take it for an upset stomach. The charcoal helps to draw the toxins and the mint settles the stomach. The stinging nettle is an excellent source of nourishment. It's plentiful and it's easily identified. If you brush against it, you get stung. And the best way to remedy that is take a pinch of the plant crush it and rub it on the stung part. Now, the stinging sensation is caused by formic acid. And as soon as we boil this, that's eliminated. Now, the nettle contains vitamins and minerals, and we make a nettle tea by taking a handful of the leaf, boil it, and if we drink this, it's full of iron and it's a good pick-me-up. The dried stems are very really tough and can be used as twine. Also, if we want to dye our clothing green, we just put it in with a selection of leaf, boil it all together, and we finish up with an olive drab material. 
You can make a useful tea using pine needles. Pine needles contain vitamins, especially vitamin C. Take a pint of water and boil it, allow it to cool. Take a handful of pine needles and let them seep in the water. Now don't boil the needles in the water, otherwise you'll destroy the vitamin content. Now when you're feeling weak and lethargic, try some pine needle tea because it acts as a stimulant and a tonic. It's a pick-me-up. Also, while you're by the edge of a wood, have a look around, you might find some useful fungi. Fungi come above plants on a nutritional ladder. Pound for pound, they've got more nourishment. However, with plants, we've got an edibility test. With fungi, it must be one of positive recognition. If you're not sure, leave them alone. Now, fungi is just a plant without chlorophyll, so consequently, it must feed on dead or decaying matter. Now, the big drawback with fungi is some are deadly. Just here, we've got the worst case, the Amanita phylloides, or the death cat. Now, this has got the following characteristics. It's got a vulva, it's got a ring, it's got white gills. Now, the season for this is summer, late autumn. You never find it in pastures or meadows, only in or around woodlands. Now, there's three bad things about this fungi. One, it smells of raw potatoes, so it's a familiar smell. Secondly, it tastes sweet. Thirdly, and the worst case, nothing happens after eating between 5 and 18 hours. What it is, is a series of alkaloids, and when it mixes with your body chemistry, it sets up toxins. And these are distributed in every cell of the body. So you must get medical attention quickly. The Amanita phylloides accounts for 90% of all fatalities due to fungi poisoning. The first living thing an injured person in a survival situation can obtain are insects. They are plentiful and give us good protein. Things like worms, ants, termites are excellent eating. Every primitive tribe in the world, they recognise this fact and they consider them as delicacies. Here we've got an ant hill and if we just dig down, we can obtain the ants. What we do is get this, put it in water and let them float to the top, skim them off, then we boil them, and ants contain formic acid, just like nettles, and boiling gets rid of this toxin. Lofty, you told us that we need to boil nettles to destroy formic acid. Do we need to then drain off the water, or can we drink that too? Uh, no, Steve, it's important that we do drink the water. Okay, it's a contact poison, and heat destroys it, and so, what we're getting in then, if we drink all the water, is all the minerals and the vitamins, all the nourishment, and it acts as a tonic. So it's important that we do drink the water. You also mentioned soluble and non-soluble poisons. Can you expand on this? Okay, well, in the case of, say, nettles, taro, and a lot of other roots, unless we boil them, they are toxic. But the poison is destroyed by heat. And so we must make sure, whatever we're going to cook, that it is edible. Because if it's not water-soluble, like rhubarb leaves, um, what we do is concentrate the poison and make a lethal poison. And so we must know what we're cooking. And if it's water soluble, no problems, heat destroys it. But if it's not, it just concentrates the poison. Okay, got to have some knowledge here before you sure. go ahead. Lofty, the thought of eating insects is pretty disgusting to most of us. How hungry do you have to be? Well, after a couple of days, you start looking forward to anything. Now, in the case of a worm, a worm is 75% of the highest protein available. And it's just a matter of, okay, digging for them, finding them. And I don't expect anyone to eat a worm as it is. So what we do, we purge them for 24 hours, i.e. we put them somewhere where they can't eat, so all the waste passes through them. And then we dry them, either in the sun or by the side of a fire. And they go real hard, just like bacon rind. And then we grind this up into a powder, and we can then add that to our soup or our stews, and we get all that nourishment. And so we mustn't overlook anything. Now, in places like the jungle, you find termites. Now, termites, we can break the nest down, okay, put it in water, and all the insects float to the top with their eggs. We skim the, these off, and we can boil these and cook them. Also, we can hang a piece of the termite's nest above the water, and as all the insects fall in the water, they're ground baiting it, they're attracting all the fish. And so then we start baiting our hooks with the termites' eggs, and then we can start pulling the fish out. And also, with a termite's nest, we can place it on the fire, and it gives off a real thick smoke, so it keeps all the other flying insects away like mosquitoes, and it keeps the fire burning all through the night. So there is a real good place for insects in survival. 
Every primitive tribe in the world, they realize this, and they consider insects as delicacies. Well, I hope I never find myself in a situation where I have to resort to your insect recipes. But if I do, I'm ready. Okay, so far we've talked about the acquisition of water and some kinds of food, plants, fungi, and insects. I'm much more interested in acquiring fish and game, and that's what we'll talk about in the next part of our outdoor survival program. This looks a great spot for fishing. Remember fish is fourth on the nutritional ladder. We've already had plants, fungi, and insects, and fish are an excellent source of food. Now, unlike game, we do not have to mask our scent, and fish are quite easy to catch. The methods we're gonna use are nightline and a gill net. Now, for the nightline, we must have bait, and the best bait are worms. Let's see if we can find some worms. To find worms, we want to come away from the water's edge, because worms like well-drained soil. To find worms, we want to look under rocks, stumps, or even dig down in good earth. This looks a likely spot. Let's have a check under the rocks. Okay, there's a worm. Now, fish like worms because one, they're full of protein, two, the movement when they're in the water attracts them, and three, they're plentiful. Let's go and bait our nightline. This is a nightline. It's a length of parachute cord, weighted at one end with a rock, and coming off it at three foot intervals are fish line hooks baited with a worm. Take your line out from your survival tin, attach it to the line, bait the hook with a worm, and now we're ready to fish for ground feeders, mid feeders, and surface feeders. Now the top line has also been known to take water birds. We're ready now, let's go and launch it in the lake. Make sure it's securely anchored, because we're going to get a lot of fish on this line. This is a gill net. We place this vertically in the water, and we securely anchor it on either bank. And small fish and large fish are tangled in the net. The small fish get tangled by the gills, that's why we call it a gill net. Now all of this, it rolls up very small, so we should include it in a survival kit. However, if we've got parachute cord, we can easily make one. Let's see how this is done. This is nylon parachute cord, and it's made up of many strands, each one very strong. We can separate these easily just by pulling them out. Now, it's a good habit to make your bootlaces of parachute cord. Double up your strand, and we use a knot called the prussic knot. It goes over once, over twice, and goes through itself. And then we pull it tight. We want to aim for an inch and a half between knots, so we space them out on the top cord, pull them together and draw them tight. To show you the principle, I'll just do three. Then once we've got the vertical ones hanging, okay, we take the inside pair and we tie them with a simple overhand knot. What we want to try and do is get about inch and a half between knots, then we take the next pair, overhand knot, the next pair, and now you can see the net being formed. Now this seems like a lot of work, but remember we might have injured people or old people with us, and this is good therapy for them, and it makes them feel useful and add into the contribution in a survival situation. Now once this is done, this is how we put it in the water. 
I've securely anchored one end to the bank. And you must make sure it's real tight because we're going to catch a lot of fish this way. I then carefully pick the net up and I'm going to walk around the edge of the bay, pan the net out as I go. When I reach the other side, I securely anchor this end to the bank. I must ensure the net is straight down in the water. That way we're going to catch lots of fish. Okay, the net is not tangled. I'll let it sink to the bottom there. And I'm going to securely anchor it to this root here. Making sure it's real tight. I've checked the net to make sure it's straight down in the water. If we leave this now, I'm sure we're going to catch a lot of fish. It's easy to make a spear, and this is good for night fishing. If you've got a flashlight, you shine it on the surface of the water, and this will attract fish. Then they can be speared. You can also take the beta light from your survival tin, place this in shallow water, and again, fish will be attracted and can be speared. If the moon is out, any shiny object like aluminum foil will also attract fish. Now the spear is easily made. Just take a forked stick, add a third prong, and sharpen each prong and fire harden them. This makes them more efficient. Make sure it is strongly constructed. You know, I'd like to see again how you constructed that fish net. Why don't you show me the knot you used using this larger line so our audience can see. I'll just hold this out here. Okay, Steve, we double our line over, then it goes around once, around twice, and then we catch the two ends through the middle, pull them all the way through, tighten it up, there's your prussic knot. Really useful knot. Okay, fishing is okay if we're by water, but what if we're not? We then got to go to game. Now, pound for pound, you can't beat meat, and we must have protein for tissue regrowth. So if we cut ourselves or got any injury, we must have protein to heal ourselves. So now, unlike fish, we got a certain amount of skill to learn. We got to mask our scent when we lay our snares, and also we got to recognize the game trail. How are we going to catch this game? Steve, we use a snare. And for small animals, we catch them by the neck. This is called a strangle. To make it more efficient, we bend down a twitch, make a mechanism. So when the animal goes in, it takes it up in the air. So now we've got a dangle. For larger animals, we can drop a rock on them. This is a mangle. And in the case of the fishing net, the fish swim into it. It's called a tangle. So we use mangle, dangle, tangle, and strangle. And what if we don't have any snares in our survival kit? They're very easy to make and easily improvised. We can use our bootlaces, string, wire, and all we've got to make is a running noose. Okay, let's go back out in the field and see how snares are used. What we're going to use is a simple snare. We take the wire from a survival tin and we make a running noose. Size of this depends on the type of game we're going to snare. Now, rules for snares is for small game, a fist wide, four fingers high and securely anchored to the game trail. The hardest thing is to recognize the game trail and find out what sort of game is in your area. Down here, I've got a snare set. Here's the game trail and here's the snare set. We must camouflage a scent from the snare before using it. The best way of doing this is smoking it over the fire. What we got here is a snare, a fist wide, four fingers high, securely anchored, and we use small sticks to keep the noose apart. This traps from either direction. Further along the game trail, I've got some more traps set. Now, to make the snare more efficient, we incorporate it using spring tension, and the snare is set exactly as before, but attached to a mechanism. To set the snare, we engage the toggle, keeping the head out of the way, and arranging the snare on the game trail. Fist wide, four fingers high, attached now to the mechanism. So now when the animal comes into the snare, it releases and the animal flies up into the air. For larger game, we need a different mechanism. Now on the game trail, we've got a platform trap. Again, using spring tension, we have the trigger mechanism and this locks under the top bar, which is held in place 
on the game trail by two full sticks. The bottom bar prevents this trigger bar from flying upwards. Now on the bottom bar we build a platform and on this we spread some grass and now we use a foot snare. This can be nice and big so now when the animal treads on the snare it releases a mechanism, down it goes, flies up, taking the animal by the leg. This is a variation of the platform trap and we still use the same mechanism. But now, what stops the trigger bar from flying upwards is this small twig that is anchored at one end by a small stake and it's restraining the trigger bar from flying upwards. There's a small stake this end. We now, across the game trail, put a foot snare that's laid down, the animal comes along and it steads on this bar, down it goes and up flies the animal. And finally we have a leg brake snare. Now the traps we got set have been working for us, we got something to bait the snares with, making life easier. In this case we got the trigger bar, it goes underneath here and is locked in position by the bait bar. This restrains it from going forward and underneath the bait we put the leg noose so when the animal comes to feed he stands here, he takes the bait, calls it to release and securely anchoring the animal by the leg. Lofty, some of those traps look pretty dangerous. You wouldn't want one of your party to walk into one, would you? No, you surely wouldn't. Remember, they are for survival only. Never set them if you want to practice these mechanisms on a place where humans or domestic animals could be snared. They are purely for survival only. Okay, good safety tip. Now, our gill nets have been in the stream for a while now. Let's go back and see how they did. Now, we've had plenty of plants, but I'm really looking forward to some protein. For long-term survival, we must have protein. Let's hope the net provides. Yes, we got a good snack in the net. Once one fish has swam in, leave the net because they attract others. Now we must check the net at first light, noon and last light. Night lines are devastating. We've got a few fish on here. Now they don't look very big, but remember, small fish, if you get enough of them, they are a mill. You can also use a real small fish to catch larger fish. A sprat to catch a mackerel. Now this is an ideal way of fishing because it leaves you free to do other things in the camp, more essential camp duties. And these are working for you all the time. Leave them unattended. Fish are high on a nutritional ladder coming above insects. Remember, night lines and gill nets, they're lethal. If there's fish in the water, they will take them. Now once we got the fish, we have gotta prepare it. This is how we do it. There's the anal orifice, and what I'm gonna do is set the knife and split it right the way to the head. Open up the fish. It's important to look in the stomach of the fish and see what it's been feeding on. This gives us an indication of what to bait our night lines with. Okay, we use the guts for fish bait again. And also when we prepare the fish, there's no need to remove the scales. The way we're gonna cook the fish is best to leave the scales on. That's the fish cleaned. Small fish are done exactly the same way, from the anal orifice right the way through to the head. Just open them up and scoop it out. Again, see what they've been eating. That's the fish cleaned. Now fish under two inches long, there's no need to clean them. While we're by the river, we might even find ducks. Let's see how we prepare them. There are two ways we can prepare the bird. We can start by plucking it, and this is long and tedious, or we can skin it. So all we need to do is take a pinch of the skin and cut here. Insert the hands. Get 
Okay, twist the wing off. Put it all the way down the leg. Take it all the way down to the tail. Just twist the tail. And you've got a cut here, just from the back. Part of me. Okay, expose the neck, and you need your knife again here. Now we skin the bird, now we're going to gut it. Now we must do this carefully, because some birds, like crows, which are carrion, because of their eating habits, they might have salmonella present in the gut. So we must make sure we don't puncture it. Now the easiest way to contract a disease from any game is through a break in the skin. So if you've got a cut, make sure it's covered. Once the meat has been thoroughly boiled, there's very little risk. Let's see how we got the bird. Take a small pinch, put the fingers in, Okay, expose the gut, then take that cut around the line of the ribs. Here we see the liver, and in here is the bar bladder. That small organ there, that's what we want to nip out first. Now take out all the gut. Make sure it's clean all the way to the back and again all the way to the front. The bird is now clean. I'm now going to show you how to dress a rabbit. Now with large game we always cut the throat. Hang them upside down and bleed them. Now retain that blood because it contains salt and vitamins. What I'm going to do to the rabbit, first I'm going to skin it Second, I'm going to gut it, and then I'm going to joint it. So first, we take a small pinch of skin here, and we cut. Then put the knife down, and put the fingers in. It's important at this stage not to burst a gut. Now, as soon as you do this after skinning, sorry, after killing, the easiest is going to be to skin it. All the way around the back. Take it all the way down each leg. Okay, pull it all the way to the neck and take out the front legs. Okay, pull the skin as far up the neck as you can. And then just take the neck and turn it, screw it around, it separates. Now the skin is an excellent source of clothing and also we can make mocker skins from it. A little bit of fur around the legs to come off. Okay, once we got the skin off, the next step is we're going to gut it. Now take a small pinch of the gut, just a small incision, fingers in, and we pull it far and aft, and just let it all hang out. Now kidneys, we're going to retain the kidneys, and more important, we want the liver. There's a the liver, nice and healthy. Remember, it's a natural food. We've recovered the kidneys and the liver, but the rest of the guts we're going to use to bait our traps with. Now to finish cleaning, I've got to do the chest cavity and also make sure it's clean right the way through to the back. Okay, there's the chest cavity through this membrane. So open it up and there we see the heart and the lungs. 
these must be removed. And again, we're going to use these to bait our traps with. Okay, most important is the rear end. Now this tube has got to come out, and if you get hold of the towel, just pull it through, and that should draw out the lower intestine, making sure we're clean all the way through to the back. As you can see, there's a lot of flies around the animal. This is done on the trap lines, not in the camp. We must keep the flies out of the camp. Okay, what we've got to do now is remove the feet. Just take the animal, be careful here because these bones are real sharp. Just snap them off, twist them, and they come off. Now the back legs, they've got a tendon, so we need a knife to cut through. So what we do is snap the bone, expose the tendon, take the knife, and cut. The animal is now clean. What it needs now is a good wash in the river. I'm going to prepare this bird using a scalpel blade from the survival tin. Now to joint it, first I'm going to remove the legs. Just cut through here, expose the bone, go around the bone, one leg. Do the same with the other leg. Close the joint, get around the joint. All the way around the back. Okay, the neck, we're gonna put in the stew, so we just snap it back, cut through it. We can then snap that off. Whatever we got, we always cut it in half. We eat our immediate needs and the rest we preserve. Now the best way of preserving meat is by jerky. This is thin strips of lean meat, no fat on at all, and we smoke it. Cut thin strips. No more than a quarter. That's what we're going to hang up in the smoker. Next I'm going to make the stew. I'm going to use everything, the bones, the feet, and we're going to get all the nourishment we can. Boiling is the best way of preparing food. It's the safest as we destroy all germs, and secondly, we lose very little of the nutrients. Now, when cooking meat, place this in the pot first and bring it to the boil, and then reduce it to a simmer. Then start adding your plants, fungi and insects as these take less cooking time. In the pot I've got some of that duck. Let's add some of the herbs to it. Add your nettle, dandelion and mint. Not only have we got the meat to eat but we've got that rich juicy gravy. Now drink this as it acts just like a tonic. Now this is just about ready so let's swing it off the fire. You can still cook if you've not got a pot. Let's take a look how over here. This is a pit fire and we can cook over it but we do lose some of the nutrients as all the fat drips into the fire and are wasted. Now this fire it's a hole lined with stone and it's fuel economical because the stone absorbs the heat and we cook in the embers. We can cook rabbit and fish in the same method. A nice way of preparing fish is baking it in clay. This is why we don't take the scales off it. Lay your fish on clay and then start rubbing it around the body and this completely seals it. We then place it in the embers of the fire and give it 20 minutes. The fish will be cooked to a tea and when we break the clay off, all the scales and skin will come with it.
Now she's ready for the embers. The carp looks done. Let's have a taste. That really is nice. I'd like to introduce you to a nice way of cooking called a hangi. We dig a pit in the ground and we light a fire. On top of the fire, we put rocks. Now these rocks get white hot and they fall in the pit. On top of these rocks, we're gonna put whatever food we've got to cook, and then I'm gonna put saplings across, some sheeting, and then I'm gonna bury it. We'll come back in an hour and a half, and we've got a real tasty meal. Now it's so hot in there, everything gets cooked in its own juice. We can also boil water in there without a container. I'll show you that later. Now we sealed the oven, it's acting like a giant pressure cooker. Now I mentioned we can boil water. This is a rubber bag and you fill it with water, place this on the stone with your food. In an hour and a half, this water will boil. Now because we got indirect heat with no flame and there's water on the inside, this will not burst. So an hour and a half, the water will be safe to drink. This is a smoke teepee. This is how we make our jerky. Remember, we take lean strips of meat, they must be fat free, about a quarter inch thick and as long as you wish. We can also cure fish inside it. We skewer the meat on wire, hang it across the centre and we have a good hot fire at the bottom and on top of this we put hardwood leaves, oak being the best. This generates lots and lots of smoke and it dries the meat and it coats it with smoke and bacteria can no longer penetrate the meat. Now we must do this for about 18 hours. As long as we keep the jerky dry, it will last indefinitely. Let's take a look inside. Bacteria can only survive in a 3% or more solution of moisture. So what we've done here, we dried the meat so there's no more moisture. We've also coated the meat with a film of smoke which contains chemicals and this prevents bacteria from penetrating it. So as long as we keep that jerky dry, it will last us indefinitely. Now, if I start with a pound of meat and we got 500 calories, by the time I've finished, I've got half a pound of meat, but I've still got 500 calories. So it's an excellent survival food. Let's take a look what the hangi's doing. Okay, start by removing the dirt from the middle, otherwise it'll all collapse in. Put it well out the way. This has been cooking for two hours. Once we get all the dirt off the sacking, peel it back carefully, and already the smells hit my nostrils. This looks really good. The duck's cooked to a tea. Let's have a look at the potatoes. Let's have a take a look inside. That's nicely cooked. It tastes real good too. Now food is gonna help us keep condition. And because we started preserving food, if ever we got to walk to safety, we got some food to take with us. During this last field segment, you mentioned when preparing the rabbit that we should bleed the animal and save the blood. What do we do with the blood collected? Okay, it's always important, Steve, to save the blood because it's one of the few sources of salt that can be obtained in a survival situation. And so what we do, okay, bleed the animal by cutting the throat, collecting the blood, and allowing it to congeal, and it goes just like a hard cake. Now, by putting this in our soups and stews, we're getting all the vitamins, minerals, and most important, salt from the blood, and it's gonna help us maintain our health. Is it important to limit activity in order to reduce our caloric intake? Yes, it sure is, Steve. We must be calorie conscious. Calories are like dollar bills. We have gotta keep them in our wallet. So, if I was just to lie on the floor and do nothing, I would use something like 800 calories. This is my basic rate of metabolism. I use calories to help me breathe, the muscles to support my frame, and to keep a constant temperature. The moment I start walking around, collecting firewood, getting water, I can double this to 1,500 calories. Now, in normal everyday life, we're probably on something like 3,500 calories. Depends on what profession you're doing. So in a survival situation, we're looking for something like 1,500 calories. So we mustn't waste any calorie. 
Okay, so we work at half pace and we rest as much as we can. Okay, suppose we've been in a location for three weeks and no rescue has come. We have to find our way to civilization. And that brings us to the last element in our plan for survival, navigation. What's the first thing we should know? Okay, a most important item to carry is a compass. Now, there's different types of compasses we can carry, and we should never partake on a journey without a compass. Here we've got a prismatic, a silver, and a button compass. What would you do if you lost your compass? Okay, we can still maintain a heading by using what nature gives us. Okay, first we can use the shutter tip method. Now, we just take a stick about one meter tall, and we place it in open ground, and we mark the extent of the shadow. Now the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west and a southerly arc. So as it's traversing around the sky, it moves. And so we wait something like 20 minutes and we mark the extent of the second shadow. We then draw a line for the two points and this gives us an east-west line. So then we go 90 degrees to this and we get a north-south line. Now also we can use the wind. Now we must know before we set out on any journey things like topographical information, which way the land lies, rivers flow, etc. We should also find out where the particular prevailing wind blows. Now this will give us an indication and we can see how plants are affected by it and if we know the wind is in a certain direction, the way it sculptures may be sand dunes or snow drifts, we can also get a direction from that. Now also we can use plants. Now plants get attracted by the sun and all the prolific blossoms and fruit is always on the southern side of a tree. So if we look at a cross section of a tree, okay, we see which is the um, side with the most leaf on and blossom, and again, this is an indication of a direction. Tell me, there's something I've always wondered if it's true. Does moss really grow on the north side of tree trunks? Strictly speaking, no. But the lone tree in a meadow, okay, where it's not influenced by anything else, if there's gonna be anything like a shade-loving organism like moss, it will be on the damp side of the tree, i.e. on the north side, because the sun on its travel from east to west always travels in a southerly arc, so the north side is always gonna be in the shade. If we needed to, could we make a compass? Yes, we can, Steve. All we need is to take the needle from the survival tin, and we need a power source of at least two volts. And then from positive, wrap the needle with 12 coils of an insulated wire, back into negative, and what we've done is energize the needle. Now we know if we've done it because we touch it to metal and we can feel it attracting. This is exactly how they make compass needles in a factory. Now what we do now is put it on a leaf or a small piece of wood and float it on water and it will settle down and point north and south. The point being north. Now there's other methods. If we put the needle in the ground at an angle of 78 degrees and this is the angle where the magnetic field enters earth at this particular point on earth. And so what we do, we strike it four times with metal. It mustn't be stainless or copper or brass, but mild steel, i.e. a knife. And what we've done again, we've taken advantage of the magnetic field, we've energized the needle, and we've aligned all the molecules of the needle. And again, when we take it out, the point will point north. Again, put it on um, grass or a leaf, float it on water, and it will give us north-south line. And there's one other method we can use if you've got a magnet with you, just stroke the needle with a magnet, and again, it lines up all the molecules of the metal, they will point north and south, and we can maintain the direction this way. Okay, do we always travel by day? In difficult country, like mountainous or woods, yes, because otherwise um, we're prone to injury. But however, when we go to the desert, we travel at night. So if we have to travel by night, we have a whole different set of navigation problems. How do we do it? At night, we've got to use the stars. Now, the stars, they're all in constellations, and they all revolve one star, Polaris. And this is the only star in the sky that's not moving. So, to indicate Polaris, it's not the brightest star, we need these pointers to be able to pick it out. So the first one we're going to is the plow, also known as the Big Dipper or the Panhandle. Now what we do, we go to the two pointers, and we go four times the distance, and you see, we come to Polaris. Now, the plow is only in the sky at certain times of the year. And the further south we go, we start losing it. So we need to know another constellation. Now, real opposite the plow comes Cassiopeia. And again, if we go to the two extreme left stars, and then using the center star of the two, 
four times that distance and we come to Polaris again. Now, further south we go again, we start losing Cassiopeia. So now we use Orion. Now, the belt of Orion, the three stars, is smack above the equator. So to get north, we just go to the extreme right-hand side of the constellation and draw a line, and as it comes over our head, that's going to point north. So no, no matter where we find ourselves, we can always get a direction from the stars. Well, Lofty, we've learned a lot from this outdoor survival program. We know we have to have a plan for survival. P for protection, L for location, A for acquisition, and N for navigation. I wouldn't want to be in a real survival situation without the skills you've taught us today. Do you have any final thoughts for us? You now have the benefit of my knowledge that has taken me a lifetime of training and experience to acquire. But don't think just watching this video makes you a survivor. What you must do is go out and practice these new learnt skills. Now look at survival training as a pyramid. The base is the will to survive. Remember, this is a basic instinct, it's in everyone, but it's getting weaker and weaker as we get more civilised. So we must start on a firm foundation, otherwise the pyramid will topple. So on the bottom is the will to survive. Now above this we add all the knowledge. Now there's a lot of knowledge in this video and this is what we must practice. Remember, survival is a practical subject, so we must turn this knowledge into skills. Practice what you've seen. It's no good just talking about it. We must know how to light a fire, how to procure food, and all the other skills shown. Now, to top off the pyramid comes kit. Remember, we must be prepared. So we always carry our survival tin and our knife, and if the conditions dictate, we carry a parang. So we must be prepared. Now, with all the kit and the knowledge, we are now ready to tackle anything, and we can now survive anywhere in the world. Before we leave, could you show us just what sort of equipment you carry for survival? This is my survival kit, Steve, and remember, it's the peak of the pyramid. Let's remove these compasses. Okay, starting with the button compass, what else have we got in the tin? Heliograph for attracting attention. We can also use the shiny surface of the inside of the lid. The flint and steel for fire lighting, what you've already seen. Brass wire from where we make our snares and also the pot handle or any time we need a, a firm fixing. This is the beta light and again it gives us 10 years of continuous light. We can read our maps with it, we can make notes at night using this. The scalpel blade, it's very sharp and you saw this being used to make jerky from the duck. Now the cotton wool is ideal for lighting fire, but also it stops all the contents of the tin from rattling, so it keeps it nice and snug and secure. Now with the medication, I'll come back to this, but basically potassium permanganate. I'll show you what sort of solutions we can make from it. Now with medications, it's very important to have as much medical knowledge prior to any journey as possible. So the more knowledge you've got will dictate what sort of pills you're going to carry. But think through what ailments are you likely to get in a survival situation, and probably one of pain, so we need an analgesic, maybe an antihistamine if we get stung. Also, if we're in a, a malaria area, we're going to need anti-malaria tablets. Okay, this is the wire saw. Again, it's a flexible saw. It will cut wood, bone and metal. A small piece of candle, this is ideal for light and fire under difficult conditions. The medical swab, again for cleaning up a wound prior to binding. Fishing kit, and remember a small hook catches large fish and small fish, whereas a large hook will only catch large fish. Puri tabs, this is good when it's not convenient to boil our water, this is the second method. Remember, we filter our water first and then we add the Puri tab. This is a condom and again, this will carry two pints of water. Remember, we only use this as a membrane, we must wrap it inside something more solid, like our jacket, and then we can carry it safely. And finally, plasters, these are for minor abrasions or blisters, okay, cover the wound with the plaster and it's going to be more comfortable. 
Okay, now with the potassium permanganate, what we're looking to do is, you've seen it lighting fire, but now we mix it to this solution and you see it's light red. This is good for sterilizing water. We make it till it's a darker red coming up for crimson, and again we use this for an antiseptic. And finally, this is a dark purple, and we use it as an antifungicidal when we get splits between our toes, athlete's foot, this is what we treat it with. So potassium permanganate, it's a real versatile uh, chemical to carry, and it's got all them uses. Now you've got the knowledge, and you know what kid to take, leave the comfort of your house, Get up in the hills, go to the woods, and put all this into practice. Remember, survival is a practical skill.